Dr. Riley is going to be giving us a speech, but I just wanted to make sure I gave from my part um, a welcome to everybody. Thank you for coming. Hope you're enjoying the program so far. Um, wanted to present Dr. Riley just to reiterate what he said in the, um, in the beginning originally um, introducing the program that this all started first with a simple conversation that he and Abby had about a year and a half ago at this point. So um, just to prove with patience, dedication, hard work, things can get done. If you have an idea, if you have a mission, you know, grab your team members and motivate each other, help each other out, work with each other's schedule, um, and things can come true, okay? Yep. Um, so without further ado, Dr. Riley, you're right. in your hand. Thank you. Uh, how many of you had never been exposed to Myers-Briggs at all? Just about all of you had, but it's been a while, right? Okay, good, because um, like I said, there's a little controversy in the social science literature about how accurate it is. Uh, and now there's some newer instruments coming along. But for just to get you sort of level set about the differences in uh, the people that you're going to interact with uh, in your leadership roles here on campus, but also when you get out into the work world, whether you're a physician, PA, midwife, uh, medical informaticist, it doesn't matter. You're going to have to deal with a whole bunch of different personality types. And just getting a sense of, you know, the differences and how people look at the world differently are very important uh, as you uh, assume leadership positions uh, in your career. So, good. I'm glad you got something out of it. The other thing we're thinking about, and we're, we're trying to figure out how to do this, is to have everybody do this at the beginning of their orientation session when they come here. Um, and so we'll be working with uh, uh, all the curriculum offices of all the schools to figure out how best to do that, plus some other things that we want to reform orientation session. Um, this talk is one that Abi asked me to do uh, because he, he heard me give it uh, last year at the uh, New York chapter meeting of the American College of Physicians, and that is about networking. And networking is one of those things that those of us who are in the health professions, we kind of don't really get it until further along in our careers. Um, and um, again, you know, I've had wonderful opportunities uh, to, um, to be in academic medicine my whole career. I've had wonderful opportunities uh, to be elected to lead all of internal medicine for the entire country. And so those experiences and opportunities didn't come along just because it was me, it was because I had learned to develop a professional network. And part of it is, you know, I had a great mentor in my household. My late father was a surgeon, and he was just a great mentor. And I just used to copy what my dad did. And, you know, he was an extrovert, and he's the type of guy that would go into uh, to, uh, any setting, and he, he would look you in the eye, and he'd ask your name, and, you know, I just picked up on those signals. And so I take, you know, we take for granted sometimes that you have that all the time. Sometimes you don't. And even within couples, my wife is a distinguished physician in her own right. She's a very strong I. And it's kind of, you know, we joke about it now. We'll go into a restaurant and I'll sit down. The waiter, a server will come over and, you know, pass out the menus. And I say, oh, tell me your name. And I always get the name of people who serve me which I think is a polite thing to do. People like being called by their name, whether they're serving you, whether it's, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And, you know, my wife rolls her eyes, so here, here he goes again. Um, <laughs> but, you know, my kids joke about it now, too, because they're used to daddy doing that. Um, but again, that's, I think, part of being a professional is engaging with people, no matter whether they're your colleague or someone who is uh, uh, in a support role. Um, that shows good. Um, ability to engage with people and to build your network. So, so this talk is, is one where I want to just expose you to some ideas about how to, you know, develop your network. And all of us um, in medicine uh, have deep networks. Uh, I wouldn't be here without mentors, uh, without the experiences I've had to, you know, be on committees and, you know, Institute of Medicine, all that stuff. Uh, but it's, it's something that, you know, we sometimes take for granted, but it, there is, again, a skill set that you can develop in terms of how to do this. So, um, so what is professional networking? Um, 
Sometimes people interpret networking as um, brown nosing. I've heard that term used too. You probably heard it too. Um, and you may have classmates and colleagues and friends from college who, who just struck you as the, the classic brown nosers. Well, no, networking is not brown nosing. And there's another, another term I could use more Southern that I won't hear. Um, but it is a deliberate act, deliberate. That means you deliberately, you know, consciously try to build, reinforce, and maintain relationships of trust with other people to further your goals and theirs. Not just yours, it's theirs too. So particularly in medicine or in healthcare, every one of you have... Um, the opportunity to join professional organizations. American Academy of Physicians Assistants, Medical Informatics Society, you know, I'm a member of the ACP, uh, New York State, um, the AMA, uh, the Institute of Medicine. So, you know, all of those organizations, they're heavy on networking and getting people connected. Again, not just for that individual, but for everybody to have more opportunities to collaborate, uh, to work on shared issues of concern, work on policy issues, uh, write grants together, et cetera. So, that's, so it's a deliberate act of building and reinforcing so that both benefit. Now, um, the other part, now again, admittedly, I'm an E, you get to meet people for mutual benefit. Now for the I's, Again, this is something you're going to have to, to, to embrace, you know, that it's okay to go to your professional meeting and, you know, go and meet other people who are like-minded about, about your, their work or your work, or their work you know, collectively. Um, but again, that's the way that you both get benefit is by being very conscious about it. So don't feel bad that, hey, look, I'm going to, you know, this meeting because I want to meet other uh, midwives, or I'm going to this meeting because I want to meet other PA students who are like me who can't figure out what, what kind of work they want to do when they get their PA degree. So again, it can be very discreet in terms of where you are with your career professional development in terms of how you think about the mutual benefit thing. Um, so why is it important? Why do you think it's important? Somebody, why? Right. So access to uh, resources, experts, potential mentors. That's the other thing. Uh, you know, mentors, that's the windows of opportunity thing. You gain access to people that can help you in your own development as a professional. Um, and again, uh, Schneider, you nailed it. That's, that's a good way to encapsulate it uh, in terms of uh, what it is or why it's important. So the other aspect, again, it is also for you at your stage to further your career. And it, even for more senior healthcare professionals like me, uh, you know, or Dr. Sackler or Dr. Lucchese, you know, we have made a conscious decision to go to these organizations to join because we know that it would be beneficial to, and help further our career goals. So again, it's okay to be intentional about this. You should not feel bad about, you know, I'm joining because, well, that's okay, just as long as it's aligned with your professional development. And again, as you've already picked up, it helps you grow, it helps you get better, and you get the support, you know. It's nice to be with other physician assistants who are struggling or uh, with a, some decision about what, what ty type of physician assistant job am I going to go for or what specialty I'm going to go for, or even uh, you know, in, in medical, in medicine, you know, uh, what type of practice do I want to go into? Do I want to go into academic practice or private practice or a blend or whatever? So again, it, it breaks down into several, many dimensions that, again, can be helpful to you. Now, how can you present, represent yourself to create meaningful connections? And, you know, some of this seems kind of obvious, but I'm surprised even at my level, it's not so obvious. Um, you know, first thing, listen before you speak. I can't tell you the number of professional meetings I'll sit, no sooner can I sit down, somebody's blabbing, 
you know, and just, I'm not saying it doesn't, it doesn't happen here downstate, but um, <laughs> let's say I'm in Washington at a meeting or, you know, no sooner to sit down, there's just one, you know, guy or gal who just starts blabbing and dominating the discussion. So again, you know, learn to listen before you speak. Um, speak to your why, you know, and, and that kind of checks you a little bit in terms of, you know, you don't have to make uh, instant conversation and instant uh, viewpoints, but, you know, learn to speak to your why. Why do you feel passionately about this issue? Why, uh, you know, is this meeting important? Um, find the shared value. What's the value in this opportunity that is presented to you when you're in a situation? Um, and then the other thing we don't do well sometimes is follow up and follow through. I mean, there's lots of meetings we go to and people say, oh, Dr. Al, I'm going to do X and Y, and ne I never hear a thing about X and Y until I call them, hey, where's X and Y? So again, the follow up and follow through is the other major dimension of, of when you're in these situations and trying to make meaningful connections. Um, you go to, you know, you go to... Um, a social event, let's say, a cocktail party or something, and you meet somebody, you have an interesting conversation, you both are passionate about a particular issue, you say, hey, I'll be back in touch with you. Can't tell you how many times people say that and never hear from them. And so again, you have to be intentional, selective, yes, and intentional about making sure that you follow up and follow through. Uh, so again, the, one of the dimensions I think we sometimes miss out on. Um, Let's go back to the listen before you speak, because again, this is uh, something that we sometimes lack insight. Um, but you know, the usual mindset is, what am I going to say? What can I offer? What are my skills? Right? That's the usual thing. We're all very smart, very accomplished, very busy, want to get things done. So we always go to the usual mindset. Got to think about what I'm going to say, what I can offer, what are my skills? But I would argue another way to think about it instead is to listen to what others have to say and try to pick up what, are the, you know, what, what floats their boat, What's, what gets them passionate about a particular issue. Um, what are their skills that I don't have, that I admire, that I would love to cultivate, that I love seeing in action, right? Um, what are their values? Do their values align with my values? Are they passionate about good quality patient care? about education, um, you know, about caring about, uh, uh, Dean Lucchese and I were in a meeting yesterday, we were talking about, you know, uh, the education of medical students. You know, um, I'm passionate about that. Um, and I value the fact that our responsibility as health professionals, educators, is to get you guys trained so you can get out and serve. I mean, it's a very simple syllogism for me. Um, so again, the values that you can uh, sort of uh, discern by having that connection in those kind of settings. And again, it also serves as a way to filter out who you want to connect with. There's lots of people we come in contact with. I'm not really interested in connecting with them after because I don't think they share my values. They're not interested in the same thing. Their motivations are not consistent with my motivation, you know, in terms of leading, or I don't like their leadership style, et cetera. So again, it also helps you rule in, to use a medical <laughs> diagnostic term, and rule out, right? Right, Docs? Rule in and rule out. So it helps you to rule in things and to rule out people in situations that you don't want to be uh, caught into. Um, speak to your why, again. What about you do you communicate? So what about you do you communicate? And, and this, this is also uh, important to me in, in patient care, uh, you know, in the setting of interviewing a patient. Uh, I used to be a stickler when I was a, an attending uh, in medicine. Uh, when medical students would present the cases, they give me a chief complaint, patient presents with four days chest pain, uh, history of present illness as follows, da, 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 you know, go through the review systems, they get to the social history, doesn't drink, doesn't smoke, and then they move on to the exam. So, oh, wait, whoa, whoa, wait a second, wait a second. You know, patients are more than whether they smoke, drink, or use illicit drugs. 
I want to know, I used to drive my medical students crazy. Y'all lucky you don't have me anymore. <laughs> I want to know where they were born, their highest level of their education, if they're married, single, divorced, gay, straight, hobbies, their occupation. The, it, hobbies was a big one with me. What's their hobby? I mean, it, you know, it used to just crack me up if just in, in, in the old days, spare me young medical students, but in the old days we had to write it in chart. Now you guys do this. But I used to have a little box with the social history and I and I had hobbies there, like numismatics. You know what that is? Stamp collecting. <laughs> <laughs> likes collecting coins. Likes to fish. Likes to knit. Likes to crochet. And again, the reason why I did that is the next time that patient came in, you know, Mrs. Martinez, how's your gardening? And Mrs. Martinez, doctor, you remember that I garden. She thought I was the greatest doctor in the world. I hadn't laid a hand on her. But again, that helps you to make the connections, colleagues, with your patient. Just a little snippet. Or ask them about their grandchildren. Or you knew that they just went on a trip. How was your trip, Mrs. Jones? Just a little bit of that can help you connect to your patient. And again, it also helps in other non-patient situations where you get, you, you can better communicate. You become a better communicator just by those simple little things. So again, what do you communicate? Passion, mission, right? Uh, why are you interested in, in doing what you do? And how does what you do reflect who you are in the greater mission you stand for? And I would argue is all of us who have chosen to pursue a health profession, no matter what it is, that last one is very important, the greater mission. You know, how does this fit into the greater mission that you're pursuing to be a nurse, to be that, to be X, to be Y? So again, that's how you can speak to your why. Um, talking about what's on your CV will not, I assure you, will not form a deep connection. And all of us who are more senior, and I bet you all of you who are more junior, have gone to situations where somebody drones on about their CV and about where they went to school and where they went to residency and, you know, all this. Now, all that's important, but you shouldn't lead with that, guys. You know, it, it's, it's just classic when you go... <laughs> I go to some of these, these meetings and just somebody just starts, well, you know, I trained at the Brigham and, you know, all that crap, you know? Uh, nothing wrong with that. We want you to go to the Brigham and, you know, and all that, but you shouldn't lead with that, you know? Um, that's not going to form a deep connection. Or you rattle off, you know, oh, I got this award from the American Academy of Nursing, and I got this award when I was in, you know, I got the four-year perfect attendance award in high school and all that. <laughs> True fact, I did. Um, <laughs> never liked to miss school. Never, never. Um, so again, don't lead with that. Um, you know, there's a time for you to talk about your CV, your resume. But again, that does not help you to make deep connections. And again, because we're in the learned professions, we, we default to that sometimes. We default to our CV and our resume and our achievements and where we went to school and, you know, all that stuff because sometimes that's our safe zone. And unfortunately, in healthcare, it is our safe zone. We've devoted a lot of time, a lot of money, a lot of blood, sweat, and tears to get to wherever you are. And so sometimes that's just our comfort zone. But remember, that's not the way uh, intrinsically to make deep connections. And again, the genuine connections that you want are going to be the ones that help you both personally, but also professionally. Um, lead with your work. How often do you want to talk about your potential and future prospects of practicing with a new hospital or medical group? You know, okay. Instead, lead with your work. Remember, your actions speak louder than your words. Demonstrate what you have done. Um, and you can do that in conversation. It could be in the follow-up. Remember I said the follow-up sometime we're not good at. Say, hey, uh, Dr. Smith, uh, enjoyed meeting you at the American Academy of blah, blah, blah. Uh, uh, here's an interesting article, uh, or this is something I've done recently, thought you might be interested in regards. Simple kind of thing like that. Uh, now, some of you may say, well, that's brown-nosing. No, it's not brown-nosing. That's in getting that connection. 
You know, brown nosing is if you send the guy five of these in an hour. You know, same message in an hour. I'm great. This is my great article. Da, 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 da. That's brown nosing. But again, making the connection can be just sharing your work very simply in an email or a link to your website or a link to studies that you've contributed to or studies that you find interesting. You know, I still do this with my colleagues. I'll read New England Journal of Medicine. Um, regrettably, I don't have much time to read New England Journal of Medicine like I used to. But usually my Sunday activity nowadays, now this football season, I'm sitting in front of the TV watching football, flipping. But I have, you know, on my iPad, New England Journal of Medicine, JAMA. That's when I catch up on some of my, you know, my medical literature. And I'll see an article. And it's so easy now. I just tap it, forward it. Uh, I usually send this to my wife. Look at this article, you know, or a colleague across the country. I love this article. You should use it. So again, that's the way you can keep your connections with folks. Um, Find the shared value. Every relationship, every relationship, colleagues, personal, professional, blossoms from a shared value. Let me repeat that. Every relationship, whether it's personal or professional, blossoms because of a shared value. So uh, when you meet people at meetings or, or whatever, you'll connect with the people who you can easily and it's discernible, it's palpable, that it'll con you'll connect with them because of a shared value. Your passion for, uh, for taking care of kids, or your passion for geriatrics, or your passion for whatever. And so again, this is the way that we find a shared value. Um, again, the, the PVM, engaging in conversation about passion, values, and mission can help establish uh, superb connections in your career and in your life. Now, <laughs> tips for conversation. Um, I won't paint with a broad brush, but sometimes health professionals are not good conversationals. Um, we're not. You know, we want to talk about, um, you know, our work, um, and sometimes but that's not the route to you know, being a great conversant. And particularly in situations where you're not amongst a whole lot of healthcare professionals. And I know the medical students, you probably know this now. You know, when you walk into a situation, well, let me, I'll, I'll bring it down to your level. You walk into a bar now. You walk into a bar now. And I know this used to happen to me. You walk into a bar or a party, and say, oh my god. There's no medical students here. <laughs> there, there's, there's no residents here. There's MBAs and stockbrokers and teachers and athletic coaches. What the hell am I going to talk to them about? So, so again, because of the all-encompassing nature of our life as healthcare professionals, we're sometimes knocked on our feet when we're put in a situation where it's none of them are like us or like me. And it, you get a little discombobulated. So how do you deal with it? OK, simple technique. This is, um, you know, you got to know the tiers of conversation, as it's called. Tier one, the safe, safe topics, sports, the weather, pop culture local celebrities, and any immediate shared experience, OK? Somebody just got back from vacation. Oh, I just got back from vacation, too. Where'd you go? That type of thing, right? Tier two, potentially controversial topics, religion, politics, relationships. So test the water there. You know, test the water. Back off if not interested. You know, as, as much as I want to, you know, in certain situations, you know, say, oh, my gosh, the president's a bozo. I know I shouldn't do that. Not right away. Maybe after a glass of wine, everybody gets loose. Maybe so. <laughs> but, but you got to gauge it, guys. You got to gauge it. And so again, know that the tiers. And then three, tier three is really you know, intimate topics, family, finance, health, work, et cetera. Uh, you know, family and relationships, you got to be careful in terms of the tier. So know how to tier your conversation. And that's why it's always easy to be with a bunch of nursing students, right? 
or a bunch of PA students or a bunch of medical students because we now have easy rapport with each other about our shared experience. But I'm telling you, you go into a bar tonight, you know, and, and there's not a whole bunch of people like this, right, Doc? You're, you're on terra firma now? <laughs> Better footing now? There's a couple. Okay, all right, all right, good, good. So again, learn to think about the tiers of conversation that you approach and, you know, channel your inner Oprah. Channel your inner Oprah. And I don't see a whole lot of TV anymore during the daytime. So, you know, I had to go do some YouTube, you know, refresh my memory uh, last night about how Oprah does her conversation thing. I could have put Dr. Phil up there. He's another one, uh, the Dr. Phil thing. So channel your inner Oprah and Dr. Phil. Ask questions. You know, ask questions. And try not to lead with too many I statements. Oh, I just got back from, you know, Switzerland. Or when you're in a bar tonight, oh, I just finished neurosurgery, right? That'll really, that'll really endear you to a whole crowd of non-medical people, right? <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> right. So again, you know, learn to, and then ask questions. Uh, you know, hey, how, how, was, how was that experience? You know, how, tell me, what, how is it like working on Wall Street? Uh, what's it like to coach um, basketball to a high school team? You know, the, the variety of people you're going to meet in, in social situations, which, again, can be discombobulating to healthcare professionals because we talk about healthcare all day long, seven days a week, 24-7, right? So, again, try to channel your inner Oprah, inner Dr. Phil a little bit. And don't be a conversation hog. You know, we all have conversation hogs, um, you know, or met some. Uh, some of them are in our families. Um, so again, uh, be attentive. Uh, make eye contact, you know, just simple eye contact things sometimes. And when I used to interview residents, uh, uh, medical students for residency, and used to prepare uh, folks for residency, I said, look, make sure you look somebody in the eye. You know, don't go in there and say, oh, well, you know, I'm looking at the ceiling and I, I really enjoy internal medicine and I really want to be here in residency. I assure you, you're not going to get ranked just because of the looking all over the, the room type thing. So again, you know, sometimes it seems obvious, but sometimes we have to be reminded about these little things in terms of how to make connections. Um, follow up and follow through. You know, it's not just about the connections, but you got to make a genuine effort to follow up. Um, emails, the quickest, well, text messaging now is your, probably your preferred way. Email, somewhat our preferred you know, way of my age cohort. But I'm a little bit old fashioned still. I still write out a little note. Um, I have special note cards that I had made. And you know, I had lunch with. Uh, a distinguished professor from Columbia a couple weeks ago, and I said, dear professor, really enjoyed our lunch conversation. Look forward to collaborating with you down the road. Simple thing like that, best Wayne. So again, little snippets like that. Now, if, you don't, if you're not into the snail mail thing, just do the email. You know, Dear Joe, great having lunch with you, great talking to you. Uh, look forward to you know, following up. We'll see you, you know, blah. So again, the follow-up is very important. So again, I can tell if, some, if I've made a genuine connection if someone follows up with me in some way, shape, or form, whether it's a paper, a uh, snail mail letter, or a quick email, or uh, in, in some cases, a text. Um, um, so again, it's multiple layers that you can uh, sort of uh, follow up with the connections. So um, what matters? Thank you emails are very important. Uh, handwritten notes, as I just said. Um, so whatever way you can make the connection, make the connection, guys. It's very important. Don't for, make for, take for granted that, you know, oh, they're not going to read the email. Oh, they're not going to read the letter. Oh, you know, this is a waste of my time to do this. It makes a difference, I assure you. Now, how to expand your network. Um, now, I know for you eyes, who's an eye in here? Let's see. OK. Now, I know you, for eyes, this is, this is a challenge. Um, but it's, it's, it's critically important that you learn to turn it on and turn it off. Remember what I told you about President Obama? The man is an eye. I've met him three times. 
And like I said, I was blabbing on. I'm saying, oh my God, I'm blabbing on to the President of the United States right there in the East Room of the White House. Um, but he knows how to turn it on. So the eyes have to know how to turn it on also. And again, I needle my wife. She's an eye. I, I just love, we'll go to a cocktail party somewhere. And you can tell the eyes from the ease just when you go to a cocktail party. I'll go right into the middle, right? I'm like, where is, where is she? She's at the door. You know, and she's timidly moving through. She's gotten better. I'm, I'm needling her about this now. It's kind of funny. But she, you know, it's, it takes a while for her to warm up. So there's a technique for eyes in terms of social situations. If, if the room is a square, just go along the wall. <laughs> just kind of go along the wall. And after you feel a little better, and some, some, this, oh, come on, you know, and then you're in the middle, and then you're okay, and then, you know, you sort of get desensitized. So, again, how you get through that interaction is manageable, guys. It's, it, it's like I said, it's, for eyes, it's a little more difficult, but there's a little bit of trickery. Just, just go along the wall of the cocktail party. If it's a circle, go along the circle. And, and then after a while, you'll find yourself in the middle and you'll freak out. Uh, but you're okay. You would have gotten into the situation. So again, uh, start with the hello. Uh, and again, this is critically important for your careers in healthcare, is your professional societies. No matter what you are, get involved with your professional societies. Again, shared mission, values, purpose with those groups. You'll find kindred spirits. Um, you find people struggling with the same issues, who are passionate about the same things. Um, you know, and here, student clubs and organizations. I got my start, you know, I told you my story. Student council in high school, yearbook staff, get to college. You know, when I was at Yale, I was vice president of black student group at Yale. Then I was on the university committee at Yale. Then, you know, the dean calls me and says, Wayne, I want you to do this. You know, uh, graduate school at Tulane, much much to my chagrin, I get elected, you know, president of black graduate students at the, all of Tulane University. I go to medical school against my wishes. I get elected class president three times. <laughs> get elected student body president. Um, and so again, the student groups and organizations, but I tell you, I learned a heck of a lot of leadership in what you're doing now. The organizations, you know, whatever it is. AMSA, AMA, nurses, midwives, I'm telling you, this is a great preparation for uh, your career. So again, do not underestimate how important it is in terms of what you're doing, in terms of what we used to call extracurricular activities. I, I prefer to call these professional development activities at your level. You guys are professionals. This is professional development activities. Um, you know, intentions and thinking outside the box in those things. Again, you're going to go back to your organizations after this and you're going to run your meetings and you're going to be more aware of, you know, gosh, we got a whole lot of introverts here. Oh my gosh, we can't shut up the extroverts. You know, I mean, you know, so it'll, it'll clue you in and what you got to do better as your leader of your respective organization. Uh, and again, the staying connected will be much easier because of that. Um, Go to conferences. Again, this is one of the things, uh, particularly physicians, don't do as well. We don't go to enough professional meetings. You know, we're not joining uh, the specialty societies in uh, numbers that we used to see in the past. Uh, for example, the American Medical Association. You know, when I was born, seven out of 10 physicians belonged to the AMA. Now I think it's two out of 10 physicians belong to the American Medical Association. Um, we're not joining like we used to. In fact, there was a great book written a couple years ago by a sociologist that this is an American affliction. The title of the book is Bowling Alone. And it was the de decline in the fact that Americans don't join stuff anymore. They didn't even join bowling clubs like they used to in the 40s and 50s. And, and how that may be uh, contributing to the degrading of our of our uh, sort of uh, national psyche, that we just don't join things anymore. Um, so again, for professionals, it's very important that you join things, uh, again, in healthcare in particular. Um, we talked about connecting with the work. 
Um, not every event is going to be labeled as a networking event. So if you're looking through the, you know, through the conference schedule, I'm just looking for the networking events. Well, no, they're not going to label it like that. It'll say brown bag lunch. It'll say meet the professor session. You know, it'll say young professionals cocktail party. Uh, you know, it'll, it'll, that's the way it'll be listed. And what it is, it's an opportunity for you to learn to say hello and to better connect. Um, fundraisers, medical and scientific events, uh, again, you know, simple things, blood drives, bone marrow drives, whatever. I mean, these are good opportunities for students and that you should encourage your fellow colleagues in the classes to, to get involved. Um, now, there's other things. You guys are more savvy about this than I, but now we have things like LinkedIn. Uh, LinkedIn is very popular. In, in terms of professionals, having a professional, uh, your presence on LinkedIn uh, keeps you connected with your peers. Uh, there's interest groups, shared interest groups, et cetera. Um, in terms of LinkedIn in the healthcare industry, uh, LinkedIn's picking up some traction. Uh, now, our HR department, when, we, when we're looking for somebody, we post job postings to LinkedIn. Uh, LinkedIn is a strong platform now for job hunting. Uh, not only just in healthcare, but everywhere. Uh, so again, that's another sort of thing you can do. Um, one more specific to healthcare is Doximity. How many of you have heard of Doximity? Okay, good. I was just on Doximity while you guys were eating lunch because I want. I had been on. It's been a while since I went on the site, and I wanted to see what was on there. There's even a link now for residency training programs. You can go in there, click a link, put your specialty in, and it'll say top ranked, and you click that, you'll find out the top rank neurology programs in the United States. And then you can do it by region, in the south, in the west. It'll or it'll say program by size, by board pass rate. You can look up the residency programs on Doximity by board pass rate. Uh, so again, Doximity is very specific, not just to, just to MD students, but also has a nursing section and uh, you know all the other things. So Doximity is, I think, one of the things that uh, for healthcare professionals, it's picking up a lot of traction, but it has a lot of contents that's specific to your level. You also get uh, medical news on it. Uh, there's even a way now, I didn't even know this till I looked this morning, but there's even a HIPAA approved way to send uh, messages about patient care uh, if you're in a patient care setting. So Doximity is pretty impressive. Uh, and again, the residency navigator for those of you looking for medical and PA residencies can be very helpful. Uh, so again, Doximity is another way to get connected. Um, your intention matters. Remember, uh, networking is not just a business, it's a relationship. And connecting with others provides access to untapped networks for people to grow. And then you never know who you can connect with. And that's what I call thinking outside the box. Uh, you know, it's amazing. I'll go to some place and, you know, um, I, I can tell you one, one experience. I gave a talk once at the, um, it was the American Public Health Association, a big meeting in Chicago. And I, can't, I think I was talking about healthcare disparities. And it was, uh, you know, uh, an audience about this size. But the Surgeon General of the United States was in the audience. Um, and I had never met the Surgeon General. And, um, he came up to me after, and he said, oh, Dr. Rye, I love your talk. Um, I'd love to be in touch with you. I said, Surgeon General, be honored. A couple months later, you know, went, went by, didn't even think about it. I get a call from Surgeon General's office. Surgeon General wants, would like to ask you to serve on a panel that's looking at a problem. That was because I put myself in a situation where, you know, he heard my talk, he remembered me, and next thing you know, I'm in Washington at the Surgeon General's office working on, uh, you know, a big uh, national health problem. Another experience I had, I had uh, been at a meeting, can't remember where now, um, but the former CEO of Mayo Clinic, Denny Cortez, Dennis Cortez, I had just met him a couple times. It was at a cocktail party, in fact. It, you know, I remember it was at a, one of these cocktail parties at the end of the day at, at the ACP or one meeting. And, you know, I'd never met Dr. Cortez, but he had been, he had just stepped down like two or three years earlier as the head of Mayo Clinic. 
fine physician, did a great job at the Mayo Clinic. And two years later, remember when the Ebola situation happened? And remember the, the case in Dallas, uh, Thomas Eric Duncan, uh, the young man from Liberia that showed up there? Well, that case happened. We're, we're all, all of us are reading this in the paper, watching the news. And I get an urgent call from Dr. Cortez. I hadn't seen Denny in two years. And he said, um, he said, Wayne, you're, you're president of the American College of Physicians. I said, I am. And he said, um, I remember we met a couple years ago. And I said, we did. And he said that I've been asked by the leadership of Texas Health Resources. That was the hospital in Dallas where Mr. Duncan was taken, uh, uh, or Texas, uh, it was THR Presbyterian. Um, they've asked to put together a blue ribbon panel to come in and do a root cause analysis of what we did wrong with Mr. Duncan. And so I was a part of a six person team that we spent two weeks down in Dallas looking at what happened to Mr. Duncan. And again, that opportunity would have never come to me had it not been for, but for a casual conversation at a cocktail party. So again, you never know how these connections, and that was a tremendously valuable experience. You know, rendering a major opinion to a major health system and how they had suboptimal care of Mr. Duncan. Um, and, you know, it was, it was just gut-wrenching, the, the errors in medical management that happened to that gentleman uh, with the Ebola crisis and the two nurses who got sick. And we talked, to, we talked to one of them. One of them wouldn't talk to us because she was already gotten a lawyer. And, you know, how traumatized she was by the whole event. Um, the fact that in the electronic health record, somebody had turned off the prompt to ask if you had traveled recently. Why that happened when it was in the news every day for three months, all of us got CDC emails saying, you got to ask people if they traveled. And somebody had turned it off because they didn't want to bother the doctors. Right? Well, again, that experience was something I never would have had had I not had that little personal connection uh, at the cocktail party. So again, you know, this is how random some of this stuff can be. Um, your former colleagues and employers are people who are part of your network. I still have great relationships with everywhere I've been. Everywhere I've been. Um, I was at Baylor in April. They, I, had, I gave grand rounds there. I, that's where I did my residency. Uh, uh, Vanderbilt. Uh, I still have a faculty point at Vanderbilt. Uh, Meharry. I get calls from Meharry, my former Meharry colleagues all the time for letters of reference and everything. So again, making sure you keep connections with every place you've been is very important. Uh, again, they're part of your past, but they're still very important and relevant. So again, trying to maintain those relationships are very important. So you may have heard it referred to as never burn a bridge. Never try to burn a bridge. And I can honestly say everywhere I've been, I have bridges still back there that I could activate today. Uh, so again, that's part of being a professional. When you leave an organization for whatever reasons, time, you're unhappy, try to you know, maintain uh, connections. Um, so you know, to wrap it up, guys, um, you know, this is not hard. It's a little different because of healthcare. Uh, and again, because healthcare tends to be very insular and my, you know myopic, sometimes you don't get this stuff raised in your consciousness. Whereas some of your friends and brothers and sisters who go to business school and do other non-medical things, they get this quite early. Uh, but we tend not to to get it in healthcare because we're so consumed on getting past the PA whatever you know or the step one or step two or, uh, you know, the MCAT and all of the hurdles and the GRE, the GMAT and all the things you got to do to get into these programs. Sometimes we miss some of this stuff. So again, these meaningful relationships can be very formative and very helpful to your development as a healthcare professional. You know, I've just told you a few little snippets of, of how it's benefited me. You can talk to any of the faculty here. They will tell you about all the beneficial relationships that have helped them to get to where they are. Uh, so again, and engage with your peers about passion, mission, values, 
uh, maintain and follow up with your contacts, little acts, like I said, a little email, Christmas card, holiday card, Hanukkah card, you know, whatever. Um, you know, their, their kid has a bar mitzvah, send a card or email or something, or their son, whatever. Um, you know, just little things like that can, can make a difference. And um, don't forget your business cards when you get them. And I would argue even as students, you ought to have business cards. Do they have business cards? We need to give them a template. We need to give all our students, no matter what program you're in, a template where you can, and, uh, let's talk about that. You, you guys can make that happen. We'll give you a template. It'll say SUNY Downstate Medical Center, and it'll say uh, PA student or MD candidate or uh, midwifery candidate. Uh, I think you should get in the habit of doing that. And we'll, we'll get you a template where you can just type in your name and you know, print them off and so forth. So uh, Dr. Putman and his staff will help you guys to do that. Uh, because again, I think that's part of you know, your professional development as well. Um, and again, just little simple things like that can be uh, very impactful. It's a contact sport, guys. That's, it's a contact sport. You know, it's not you know, just, oh, I wish I was better connected. Oh, I wish. No, it's a contact sport. You got to jump in. Even the eyes. Remember to tell you, you got to jump in. Just do the, the thing around the, the edge of the room. Um, it'll pay dividends. Um, so again, this is, again, some of the content that we want you to have, just simple things that having your professional network is a great way to help you on your leadership journey. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. We just like to thank Dr. Rock. Give a hand, another hand. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So we'd like to appreciate you, Dr. Riley, by just a little small token. Oh, we got the, the clock and very the nice. grave of the student leadership oh, conference very going nice. on there. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Riley. Thank you very much. So right now, I know, thank you guys. Uh, you, know, uh, you know, I'm very passionate about students making sure we do the best we can uh, so that we can get you across the stage and out into the world. Uh, so again, this is very important. I'm glad you're here. Uh, this is important to me, so I'm glad it's